Hello, and uh, thanks for being here. There's a, a lot more people than GopherCon in 2014. Uh, like an order of magnitude, I feel like, in this room. <laughs> Um, today, I want to talk about advanced testing with Go. Um, I got a good introduction, so I could skip this slide with my face on it. Um, I founded a company called HashiCorp. Uh, thank you, Ashley, for this really adorable uh, graphic. Um, my fiance just is in love with this thing. Uh, but we love Go at HashiCorp. Uh, a majority of our lines of code and projects, kind of like by any metric, is written uh, in Go. And uh, it was mentioned that we have, these are the open source projects we have that are written in Go. Or no, these are the open source projects we have that are written in Go. Um, but this doesn't cover all the enterprise work we've done, uh, closed source sort of libraries we use for those enterprise products, uh, and a lot more uh, written in Go. We, we write Go all the time. Um, and something that makes this a little bit unique um, so Go's been our primary language for five years. Uh, it was definitely a bet five years ago, uh, and it's paid off. It's been great. Uh, our projects have a bunch of properties that make testing rather interesting. So there's the scale aspect, which a lot of people have. Um, our projects are deployed by millions of units, whatever that unit ends up being. There's millions of users, for sure. Um, at this point, we're sort of hitting the millions of servers as well. Uh, and then there's, it's deployed significantly uh, in enterprises, which has a different expectation of software uh, in a variety of ways. So there's that aspect. Uh, we build a, a bunch of different categories of software uh, that differ product by product, which affects our approach to testing and our viewpoint on testing. So we have a number of distributed systems, uh, console, surf, nomad. These could be viewed as, you know, sort of at their core distributed systems. We have certain software that has performance that matters a lot um, in, by certain metrics. And so console uh, read performance matters quite a bit. Uh, Nomad scheduling performance matters a lot. Um, we have tools like Vault. Uh, Vault is a security tool. And so it has a high, you know, it almost has to be sort of perfect degree of security we need to maintain. Um, and testing has to come into that in addition to other things. Uh, and then at the end, there's, there's correctness of when things don't work correctly, it could be very detrimental. So all software has bugs. We ship bugs. Everyone ships bugs. I'm not saying we ship perfect code. We don't. Um, but things like Terraform, we need to make sure that when we ship a Terraform update, someone doesn't run a change and their whole infrastructure disappears. Um, or someone updates console and they lose all their data. Um, or someone updates Nomad and we decide to deschedule all their services. There's catastrophic things uh, on the correctness scale that we need to definitely prevent. Uh, and then coming back from the catastrophic things, there's just uh, more details of correctness we, we want to ensure. So the way this talk works um, is that there's, there's really two parts to testing, um, and you need both of them to, to produce uh, to produce good testing. And so there's test methodologies, uh, which is writing the tests themselves and how to write the tests. Uh, and then there's writing testable code, which I think is equally important. You can't just take any kind of code and write great tests for it. And so this is also the slide style um, to make it really simple. So the slides that are in black background um, are going to be about test methodologies, and the slides that are in a white background are going to be about writing testable code. Um, so to explain that in a little bit more detail, so test methodologies, starting with the slide styling right away, um, are methods to spe test specific types of cases that you see um, when, you're, when you're writing tests. Um, they're techniques to write better tests. Um, better is defined in a bunch of different ways throughout the talk. Um, and it's, it's trying to explain that there's a lot more to testing, as we all probably know, than assert something. And then there's writing testable code, um, which, like I said, is how to write, test, how to write code that can be tested well and easily. Um, and this is just as important. Um, it's very common, uh, both from junior to senior engineers, I see it all the time, to hear things, hear, hear people say, this just can't be tested well, so I didn't write a test, but I ran through it or something. Um, and they might not be wrong. Like, they, they, I might look at the code and say, like, you're not wrong. This can't be tested in any reasonable way. 
Um, but by refactoring in a certain way, by re-architecting it in a certain way, you could usually get to a point where at least 90% of that functionality is tested, and maybe the 10% that's very hard to test is, remains out there. Um, and so at HashiCorp, we, uh, I don't think we've ever seen anything that can't be tested very well, and we hit a pretty broad spectrum. Um, and rewriting existing code could be a pain, but it, usually for testability, it's worth it. Okay, so from here on out, we're just gonna dive right into it, and it's just gonna be, um, I mean, it's just gonna be like a machine gun of about like 30, I think 30 different methods and uh, how to write testable code in total, and so we're just, we're just gonna get going. Oh, the last thing in the slide format is they are in order roughly from things I expect everyone in this room to know to getting more and more esoteric and weird. So at the be don't be discouraged at the beginning if, you're, if you think, oh, this is just a really beginner talk. Um, or I'm gonna try to ramp it up for you. So um, I won't promise that everyone will take at least one thing away, um, but I hope that everyone will take at least one thing away. Um, so starting right at the beginning with, with simple stuff, I think, um, and skipping how to write a, a single go test. I assume everyone knows how to write one go test, so skipping that. Um, is subtests. Um, subtests are new in Go 1.8, um, officially, um, and they look like this. So they let you write a test, and they let you um, nest, sort of by calling run, they nest, let you nest subtests within a test. And, oh, that's good, I, I didn't do the output. But um, if you run the test, you can target those subtests. Um, when you look at the output, it lists all the subtests. Uh, and there's a bunch of benefits to these things. So for example, your subtests are a closure, so now it defers work within those. You could use, if you have a huge set of test cases and you're opening files or making network connections or something, you could actually run defers in these subtests rather than uh, accumulating them or like in the past before this was an official thing, I would actually just make an anonymous function that I called right away just to get the defer functionality um, as part of it. Um, and you can nest them infinitely. So, it's built into Go. Um, you're allowed to target subtests, and you could just continue to nest them further if necessary. Um, and it's hard to explain the value of subtests without talking about table-driven tests, since I think this is the nine out of 10 use case for subtests uh, that I've found. And so table-driven tests uh, look a little bit like this, and I've used the subtest syntax here too. They're a way to build a, a table of data and a table of test cases within a single test um, and run through them. So in this case, we're testing addition, just as an example. And so there's a bunch of cases up here where we specify the operands for A and B and then the expected value uh, by adding them together. And then you could loop over them, run the subtests, uh, and make it work. And there's a few things I'm showing here. Um, so one, naming the subtests. So in this case, I name it by just with the, the value, like what, what's actually being tested. Um, that's sometimes useful, and then I'll show you in a little bit another option, uh, and then using the actual subtest itself. And so we use table-driven tests a lot. Um, we use it a lot at HashiCorp. I like to almost default in a lot of cases to table-driven tests, even if I have a single case. Um, I like to just set it up, the structure, because if I look at something and I think, yeah, there's probably a scenario where we want to test other parameters here one day in the future. I'll just set it up from the beginning um, with a table. Um, so I like to do that. It's low overhead to add a new test, um, which is the best case. When you're fixing a bug or you find a bug, um, creating a regression test uh, and adding the case is super, super easy for the developer. Um, it makes testing exhaustive scenarios both simple uh, technically but also visually simple. Like, uh, depending on what you're testing with a table, like it's easy to see visually if you've exhaustively tested sort of all the edges uh, of your function. Um, let's see. Uh, yeah, we do this pattern a lot. So I recommend just doing this wherever. Uh, it's, it's a little bit of overhead, but a lot of value, I think, in the long run. The other thing I would say is consider naming the cases. Uh, so here's another example where we just put a name in the test case, in the table uh, thing, and then when we run the subtest, we actually use the name there. Uh, we used to, this is like a long, four years ago when we did table tests, we used to uh, just generate all the, the subtest names at the time, they weren't real subtests, uh, with just the data. Um, but as you get more complex table-driven tests, that starts becoming really unclear. 
Um, and if you just do like a loop with indexes, the indexes are unclear. Like some people will just do the name as the index uh, of uh, of the the slice. And when it's like test failure, you know, test index number 314 failed, uh, it's really hard to find 314. There's definitely been times like in Terraform where we've just been, gone through a file and been like zero, one, two, three, four. Um, and that's usually when we start adding the names to things. So that was a mistake we made early on. Um, and I want to add as a disclaimer, like we, I'm not trying to claim at any point during this, this talk that any of these things I say are novel. Uh, a lot like table driven test, the first place I saw it was in the Go standard library. Um, a lot of these things are from the Go standard library. Uh, I've seen them maybe in other projects, but I just, I don't remember anymore. So it's just the, the list. All right, let's keep going. Um, test fixtures. So, uh, test fixtures. So you could do this. You could access data using test fixtures. And you can notice here that I'm just accessing data relative to the current working directory. In a test fixtures folder, you can name it anything you want. Um, so little known thing for a lot of beginners in Go is that Go test will always set the current working directory as the package being tested. So when you do Go test period slash period 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 and you're testing all your packages, uh, each time it goes into a new package, it sets the current working directory to the package being tested. And this is really helpful because uh, it lets you use relative paths to access data if you need to for your tests. Um, at HashiCorp, we use the name test fixtures um, for no specific reason as the directory where we store our test data. Um, but it's very useful for things like loading example configurations. We test most of our software against real example configurations, so just writing files as you would if you were running it. Um, model data for web applications, uh, actual fixtures there. Now, binary data, super useful. Um, we use it to test, you know, certain, uh, like Nomad, how it handles um, tar.gz or uh, Docker images and things like that. Um, we, we use test fixtures for this. Just keep going. Uh, golden files, so this is something that's definitely I saw in the, in the standard library, I remember that. Um, it's, and golden files is what they called it, I think, in the, in the standard library, which is why I call it this here. Um, golden files are a way to uh, compare complex test output to a file that has the expected result. So um, the place in the standard lib where I first saw this, I'm not sure if it's the only place it exists, is to test go fumpt. Um, when, when they test go fumpt, they run go fumpt, and then they compare the resulting bytes to a golden file's contents. And they put this flag, which is really interesting. If you put, if you put a global flag um, in your test, it actually becomes available on go test. And so they put a flag update that when you use the flag update, uh, it actually updates all the golden files. So your test will always pass when you use the update flag because all the files will get uploaded, uh, updated. But you could use that to update the golden files. And it's really um, a much better way to compare lots of bytes than just putting the bytes in a constant or something in the footer of the file or in the test itself. Uh, and so uh, just run it, I'll just run through this real quick since it is a lot of code, but it's actually usually the pattern that golden files take more or less. Um, you usually have a table with golden files. That's usually part of the thing. It's either a table or it's a, a generated table from a directory uh, or something. You go through, you do something to get the actual bytes. That's the actual assignment there. Um, you load the golden file by usually the name. You load the golden file. If the update flag was specified, you update the golden file. Um, and, and don't judge me. I'm ignoring errors here because we have limited space. I, I would test the errors usually. Um, then you read the golden file and you just do a bytes equal check. And if it fails, uh, you come up with some way to show a diff of that. So like the thump test, for example, actually have a really nice diff function to show the diff uh, in a way that isn't just here's bytes one and here's bytes two and they just don't match, just find the difference. Um, but depending what I'm testing, sometimes that will be what I do um, or I'll actually do the diff. And then when you run go test, this is what it looks like. You could just introduce flags uh, as you want. Um, and I guess I don't have another section that explains that, but you could introduce flags to the go test command. And we use that for things other than golden files. Uh, we use that in some tests, I'm trying to think, to, to disable certain types of very side effecty tests or very expensive or very slow tests. Um, you could just introduce flags. Uh, and I think 
yeah, I think I covered all this. I have a lot of these bullet points to make it more friendly for when I upload the slides. Okay, so we did a lot of test methodology, and now we're gonna see our first how to write testable code, um, and there's gonna be a lot more from here on out. So global state, I think this is pretty obvious, um, but avoid it as much as possible. There's a lot of reasons to do this, of course, um, but in the context of tests, it's really important to avoid it because it makes your tests depend, you know, change depending, potentially change depending on the order they're ran. Um, it makes it difficult to reason about, you know, the full sort of inputs that are necessary to affect the behavior of, of some, some thing. So instead of, try, instead of using global state, um, we try to make whatever is global a configuration option. Um, maybe we set up a constant that's the default value in the global scope, uh, but we still always try to make a configurable thing um, because you usually want to modify it or twiddle it uh, for tests. So here's some examples of, you know, not good, better, and best. Um, it's actually, be it's, so this is a weird antipattern. Like you, should, you probably shouldn't be using global state at all. Like making a globally modifiable variable seems worse than making a constant. Um, the reason it's usually better is because constants are, they really limit your testability. And so making it a variable, at least you could change some behavior in a test, um, but the best is actually making the top level a constant and then making some sort of way to modify that uh, in another way. Okay, test helpers. Um, so here's an example of a test helper that creates a temporary file. Um, so there's a few properties of this test helper that um, I'll talk about. So one, the test, help, test helpers should never return an error. Um, you know, functions in Go should always return errors. Test helpers should never ever return an error. They have access, they should have access to the T structure, so just fail the test if there's an error. Um, the other thing is uh, sort of by not returning the error, you make the test usage a lot clearer. If, if your test helpers return an error, your tests that use the helpers turn into run test helper if error not equal null, you know, fatal, over and over and over, whereas when they just fail on their own, you can get a really dense block of test helper calls, you know, right at the beginning to do a bunch of setup, and it's just a lot, it removes a lot of, I would say, like, visual overhead when you're trying to figure out what a test does. Um, and you should be careful about when you make these test helpers. I guess I get to that. Um, so I'll just talk about that later. The other thing I want to point out is I use a feature that's in Go 1.9, um, t.helper. Uh, so that just, just was introduced in 1.9. Uh, but by calling t.helper in, in a test helper, it makes the error out, the stack trace output better um, when some, you know, panic situation happens in a test helper. Uh, test helpers have been notorious in the past for panicking and the, the failures there, but it's sometimes hard to find the exact test where that failed. So if you're moving on to go 1.9, I recommend just dropping this in all your test helpers. Uh, and so I do, I, I explained all this stuff, so I'm going to skip it. Um, the other neat trick is if you have cleanup to do, you could return a closure, and we usually just return in a func, like no return value closure, to actually do the cleanup. So in this example, here's the temp file where as cleanup, we actually want to delete the temp file. And so what we do is we do all the setup, we error if we have to, and what we do is return the temp file, return a closure that deletes it. Um, and the benefit of this is that closure, since it is a closure, has access still to that T, um, T value. So it could check the error. Like in, in the production code where we use this, we check the error of OS remove. Um, OS remove can potentially fail. And if it fails, we do a T.fatalf. And you don't have to pass that back because we, we already closed over it. And so when you use it, it ends up looking uh, like this. Um, sometimes you could get really clever. Um, and it's not always beneficial for readability, but sometimes you could get really clever uh, if you're setting up some side effects, some, some world state that actually has no return value um, of just returning the function alone. You could one line the whole thing. And so this is a more or less, I mean, I think it's a little bit longer, our actual one, because we check all the errors, but there's more or less a test helper we have in, in all our projects uh, where we could change a directory uh, to test things. And, and usually we're changing directories to test CLI behavior. Um, but you could one-line it. The negative aspect of this is a new developer coming into the project, looking at that line. It's not super obvious, like, that what that's doing. Um, so that's a downside. The, the argument we sometimes make is that we, we really only use it, I think, for CHDR, uh, and it's 
we think this particular case is obvious enough. So I said all this. Um, most important thing is you have use the testing.t. Just use it in your test helpers. Uh, don't return errors in your test helpers. Okay, this is uh I guess I should also say that some of these I expect people will disagree with. <laughs> so this is one of those that that I think multiple times at HashiCorp we've hired very experienced Go engineers, and this is something that have, has sometimes uh rubbed them the wrong way, but it makes over time we found everyone kind of likes this more. So repeat yourself in tests. Um, what what we prefer, what I prefer overall in tests is localized logic as much as possible. When a test fails, I usually, or I or someone else usually wrote that test a long time ago, um, and it's failing because I'm doing a refactor, I'm doing a new feature that caused it to fail, and I don't really remember the details of the test anymore. And there's nothing more frustrating to me than going to a test and realizing it calls seven different functions that are in four different files, and I have to like start building all this mental context of what's happening, why is it doing that, that sort of thing. Uh, it's much easier, actually, uh, I think, to just have a huge test that's like 200, 300 lines of code that just does everything right there so that I could just go through it and understand exactly what that test is. Um, the project where we do this the most is Terraform. Uh, if you go in Terraform, there's files called context underscore and any of the tests in there. Uh, the, each test is around 200 lines of code. And when we write a new test, what we do is we take an old test, we copy it, we paste it, and then we start modifying the five lines we need to modify. Um, and it feels bad sometimes, but it's been, you know, four years, and we get a lot of test failures in context because it's sort of the core of Terraform. And it's super, super helpful to be able to open one, you know, Vim panel, look and have everything there that you need to figure out why the test is failing. So copy and paste for tests. Um, we, don't, we don't practice repeat yourself too much in actual non-test code, but in tests we do prefer a uh, 200 line test to a 20 line test with abstracted helpers. Packages and functions. Um, I, saw, I saw on Twitter some slides about anti-patterns that talked about some of this, and I, for tests I agree with some of them, and then some other ones uh, it's, it's questionable. So, um, you know, break, this is hard because it's gonna be, you get this with experience with Go. You can't, there's no real hard and fast rules. You could come into Go and know exactly when to make a package and when not to. Um, and so, the, what you want to be able to do is break down functionality into packages and functions when it makes sense. The when it makes sense is super difficult to explain. Um, you also don't wanna overdo it, um, which is super hard to explain. Um, but doing this correctly aids testing quite a bit because it gives you a much cleaner surface area of what to test. Um, you know, you know, there's certain safety mechanisms of package boundaries and unexported versus exported that you don't need to worry about, um, and, and it makes things a lot easier. So a good example here is Terraform has a DAG package for doing uh, directed acyclic graphs, and that DAG package was written, I don't know, in 2013 or 2012, uh, and it's been, it's been touched like three times in four years because, because writing, writing a simple like graph library doesn't usually require change. Um, so we write the test there, we know the coverage of that package is 100% at all times, um, and we know the bugs likely aren't there. Um, but it's, it's, there, there's some issues with this like packageification. So, uh, oh, I actually didn't bring this in here. It's the next slide. Um, but unless the, the function is extremely complex, um, we usually try to only test exported functions. Um, we view sort of the exported API as the place where we need to do the test. Um, but for internal helpers that are, that are really complicated or fan out quite a bit or have a lot of edge cases, we will test those internal functions. Um, some people do take this too far. Uh, the, the way to take this too far is that, the, that you only do like sort of integration or acceptance test levels. Like if I just test the black box behavior, then I know it works. Um, I personally believe that's a little bit too far, so we try to, we do acceptance tests as well, so we try to balance out the acceptance test usage with testing the exported API with, uh, um, with sort of um, th uh, educated, you know, choices of testing internal APIs as well. 
Um, yeah, we usually treat the unexported sort of function constructs as implementation details. Um, and by not testing those specifically, it makes refactoring a lot easier in the future. But you want their logic, like what, the, what they're trying to achieve, their goals they're trying to achieve, tested via the exported APIs. And if you can't do that, you probably have to unit test the internal ones. Um, so and there's internal packages. And I don't remember what Go version this was introduced. It's like 1.4 or 1.5. Um, but if you make a package named internal, then any pack, I can't explain it in one sentence probably, but any, any packages sort of under that can only be accessed by packages in folders less than the folder contain. It doesn't matter. So there's, there's, <laughs> there, there's internal packages. They uh, allow you to create a mechanism whereby external people cannot import your internal packages. Um, and we like to use this actually as a mechanism to, to uncomfortably overpackage things. Um, the th and so this is where um, I saw a slide yesterday that said, don't overpackage, if anything, underpackage. Um, and we used to do that. And the issue we ran into, and Terraform is a living embodiment of that issue right now, is Terraform underpackaged. And it's basically impossible right now for us to re-split out all the packages we see in Terraform without doing it atomically. Because every time we try to do it incrementally, we just get import cycles, because everything is tying into everything. Um, and so if you look at Vault or something in our forward things, we overpackaged from the beginning. And we ended up deleting some packages because they didn't make sense as packages. But we have a much better package breakdown. Um, and one of the ways to do this safely without creating public API for, for you to promise people anything is to use internal packages. That way, you know, if you have, I'm exaggerating here, but if you have like 500 internal packages, to the end user it still looks like one. Um, so I would say, you know, do, again, it's the package boundary thing is so qualitative um, and so experience based that it's hard for me to give any hard and fast rules. Um, but the package boundary stuff will help testing quite a bit. Um, so networking, how do we test networking? We have all our software, I think, actually does networking to some extent. And so what we want to be able to do is test network connections. And so if you're testing networking, make a real network connection. There's, I don't see it actually very often anymore, so I think we're, we're in a really good spot. But early on, at least, in Go code in 2012 and so on, I saw a lot of people trying to mock net.com. Net.com's an interface. That seems like a perfect place to create a mock. Um, but there's really no point uh, to mocking net.com, and I'll explain. So here's a fully functional, I think, yeah, I think it works, um, connection uh, a helper to create a test connection with the client and server end. And all we do is listen. We use the operating system to choose our port for us. Um, we bind it to localhost so we only we can connect ourselves. But it's you know just choose a port. I don't care. You immediately make the connection. Um, the accept, you can see, is not on a for loop. So the moment that we accept a connection, we close the listener, which does not close the connections. We just don't accept any more. Um, and then we, we dial it at the end, and we just return the client and server. And you could close them on the reverse side. Um, and so that was a. That was a one connection example. It's super easy to make an end connection test helper. Um, it's easy to test any protocol this way. We actually, in Packer, for example, we have this to test SSH connections. And the way we test SSH connections is we create a real SSH server. We create a listener. We connect to it. We shut down the SSH server. We return the two connections. And so you have a real SSH connection. Um, it's easy to return the listener if you need the listener. It's easy to test multiple networking types, IPv6 or Unix domain sockets or other things. It's all there. Um, and then rhetorically at the end, you know, sort of like there's no reason to ever mock a netcon. Uh, configurability on the how to write testable code side. Um, so unconfigurable behavior is very often the point of difficulty for tests. Uh, your code is doing something um, that may totally make sense for production usage. Uh, so it's not configurable, but the tests want to do change the behavior, make it faster, skip some safety tests. I don't know. Um, and so what we usually do is over-parameterize our structs to allow tests to fine-tune behavior. Um, and if you really don't want users to do this, just make the parameters on the structs unexported. Um, another thing we do, and I don't know, if, yeah, I don't think I showed in the example, um, is we prefix sometimes these with test so that people know that their parameter is only to be used with tests. Um, but by making them over, over parameterized in the beginning, it just makes that a lot easier. Um, so here's, here's an example like cache path and port 
in this example, they may always be the same. They may never, in production, they may maybe should never change. Um, you should still make them configurable because in testing you probably do want to change them. Uh, I don't remember what this is. No, I'm going to skip that. I don't remember what that's there for. Um, so another thing we do pretty commonly is just make a big, like, test bool. And the comment above it should very, should very clearly define what behavior that's going to change. Uh, but the most common way uh, I've seen this used, uh, we've used it a couple times, but the most common way I've seen this used is to, like, skip off in, in a web application or something. Like, say your web application's only mechanism for logging in is OAuth. Um, testing or simulating OAuth completely is kind of a bear. And so instead of doing that, we could just set test equals true, and that'll always OAuth you as the same person, you know, OAuth. It doesn't actually do any OAuth protocol stuff. It just gets the request to OAuth and immediately pretends you're logged in right away. All right, complex structs, testing complex structs, uh, struct values. So, uh, yeah, so an example here would be Terraform has a graph structure. Um, and the graph structure has a lot of, obviously, you know, pointers to children. There's data on the nodes themselves. And we want to be able to test that one graph equals another graph. Um, the blunt instrument that everyone uses, we use a lot. Um, to test complex structs is reflect.deep equal. Um, you just use that and verify the structure the same. Um, a slightly better approach uh, is, to f is there's actually a number of really good third party libraries now that do struct comparison and generate nicer error messages when they don't equal. I'm sure a lot of people here have run into the like hour, hopefully an hour or less, but maybe more, hour loss when reflect.deep equal returns false and it's because like you had an int and then the actual type was like int 64. Um, and that causes that to fail, and it causes you to rip your hair out because you're dumping, you're dumping the structs, and you're looking bite by bite, and you're like, they're the same, they're the same struct, um, and stuff like that. So there's better ways to do it. Um, one thing we do um, at times, not blanket across all complex structs where it makes sense, is we use this pattern of test string. It's like the Go stringer interface, but for tests and unexported. So we do this lowercase test string thing, you use bytes buffer or fumped or anything to create some human friendly output that's testing the things that matter. Uh, and then when you're testing that complex thing, you actually just compare the strings to each other. Uh, and a good example of where we use this is actually the Terraform graphs. So the graph root or any graph node has this test string on it. When you call test string, we generate a human readable sort of like indented structure to represent the graph. Um, because that's what we care about the most uh, when we're testing those things. And that's a lot, I mean, it, reflect deep equal would check too many fields that we don't care if they match. Um, and you get into a lot more complex things. So for data structures like trees, linked lists, et cetera, um, this sort of pattern helps a lot. Uh, and like I said, you could use reflect deep equal, a third party lib. We certainly do that in different places. Um, and I'm going to be honest that the test string thing is pretty blunt. Like, you, when people see it, it's kind of weird. Um, but we've had really good results for complex structs. And here's an example of, like, the test string output we generate for our graphs in Terraform. It's like a, a simple graph testing a simple single dependency. Uh, and these, these are the strings we compare. And so when they fail, it's actually a lot easier for us to generate diffs and failure output that helps versus, you know, these two graph structures that together have I don't know. Well, this is a simple one, but in, a, in the more complex Terraform tests, like for example, a graph could very easily have 2,000 or more graph nodes in there, and a reflect deep, deep equal failure is a nightmare to debug, whereas this is a lot easier. Subprocessing. Um, this one is another one I specifically remember I, I got from the Go standard library um, and thought was genius, whoever did that in the Go standard library. So, subprocessing is a typical point of difficult to test behavior. Very, very typical. Um, and there's usually two options when, when you're faced with the need to subprocess. You could either actually do the subprocess, or you could mock the output or behavior, uh, or mock the whole subprocess in general. So um, as an example, like say you're writing an application that interfaces with Git um, and does a Git status to see what's going on. Um, you could either actually execute git and set up a git repository so that git status outputs what you would like it to output, or you could create, you know, some way to 
you know, test configurability to route around that and just pretend you outputted Git and give you some mock data. Um, we like to actually execute a subprocess, but it might not be the binary, the real binary that you're executing. Um, and so the one option is to just execute the real thing, um, in this case, git for real. Um, and what we do is just ex subprocess it. There's no real complexity here. Um, but we do guard the tests to make sure that the binary exists. So um, as an example, like here's something we'll do uh, in the in a module in it, uh, uh, in a package in it, we'll do a look path to just kind of as a best guess to see if git's available. We'll set some global variable, and then in the tests themselves, we'll just, we'll just guard on it and skip uh, if it doesn't exist. We do this kind of pattern a lot, usually to help with like Travis CI testing or testing in environments that can't support certain types of tests or it's more difficult to support certain types of tests. We do this sort of thing. Uh, the other approach is to mock it, and the mocking is where it's a little bit different because we don't ever mock the output. We actually always still execute something, but we're executing a mock. And so to do this, the place where you're subprocessing, you need to make the exact command arguments uh, configurable so that you can pass a custom one so that you don't hard code git in there. You don't hard code that there's never environmental variables in there. Just let, let the caller somehow, and again, it could be a test only unexported field, but make the caller somehow modify it. Um, and like I said, I found this in standard lib. It's actually how they test OS exec. Um, but it's how we test a ton of things. So here's, here's what it looks like. It's, it's not obvious, I think, from the beginning, but it's also not complicated. So what you do is you create this helper process thing, which returns an exec command, which is going to execute back into the test, into a custom sort of entry point. Um, what this does is it runs a really specific test called test helper process. It does a dash dash, so we could parse some other stuff later. We also specify an mvar to explain that we really want to run this thing. Uh, and then we construct a command. And then on the flip side, the actual test itself, um, what it does is it tests if that mbar exists, and if it doesn't, it returns. So this, w this way, when you run go test, it doesn't actually do anything. Um, otherwise, we use that dash dash as a sentinel uh, flag to figure out where the actual args begin. So if you were doing git status, it would actually turn into this go test run something dash dash status is what would actually end up happening. Uh, and then we, you could do anything after that. You're, you're executing your own program of sorts. Um, so we usually switch on like arg zero, uh, args left, rest, and, and do stuff. And doing this, you could test anything. Uh, you could just subprocess test anything. Okay, so seven minutes to get through a lot of things. So interfaces. Um, interfaces are important mocking points. I'm sure we've heard this before. They're not just pluggable points for consumers. They're important mocking points for testers. Um, when you have an interface, you could uh, test that interface by creating a mock one easily. So similar to packages and functions, it's very hard to create hard and fast rules of when to create an interface. It's very easy to over-interface things. Um, you kind of will get that over time. Um, but I would say create interfaces where you expect alternate implementations and create interfaces where um, that you feel is the best way to test that thing. Uh, but overdoing it will complicate the whole thing. Um, we prefer to use smaller interfaces where they make sense. So even if we have a big interface, if the only functionality we, we need is the I.O. closer, then the function that takes that interface, we'd rather just take an I.O. closer rather than the whole thing. Um, this might just be a good practice in general, but it's a good practice for testing because it simplifies the interface surface area that has to be implemented to do a test. So here's an example. Um, a very common example, actually, uh, common in the standard lib um, is that the servcon type methods take read-write closers, even though all, if you look at the things that call servcon on their own, they're always netcons. They're usually always netcons. Um, but mocking, like I showed you, like mocking a netcon or even creating like um, a small netcon is overkill if you could just create a simple read-write closer to test the servcon uh, function. So uh, that's an example of, of lowering the responsibility of an interface that helps with testing quite a bit. It also makes using it in, in actual code easier. Okay, next thing is testing as a public API. Um, this is something we only started doing 
in the past 18 months or maybe two years. Um, so newer HashiCorp projects have adopted the practice of making a testing or testing underscore something file. And so you could tell by the name of the file that this becomes compiled as part of the actual exported code. It's not just test only code. And we actually start export, we started exporting APIs for the purpose of easing mock creation test writing for consumers of that library. And so it allows other people to write tests easier. Um, so here's one example, which is a config file parser. Um, for Terraform, for Vault, we have some of these, which is we export test config, test config invalid, just to easily just give them the structure they need for a valid config and an invalid one. Um, really basic. Here's a more complicated one that consumers love, right? It's just make me a server. Um, so test server will return the address to connect to as a client and an IO closer to clean up the server. Uh, the place where we have this is Vault. Vault actually exports a function for you in Go to create a fully in-memory, non-durable server. That's, that is Vault. So you could actually create a Vault client, connect to it, and test communicating with it. And it's a publicly supported, exported API. Um, and then the other way is we actually export functions that test implementations of an interface to see if they behave to spec of what our behavior expects. So example is we have a library that downloads things. There's no other way to describe it than it just downloads things from anywhere using anything. Um, and so you implement this downloader interface in order to uh, create a new downloader. And there's some behavior we expect. Like if we download, um, if we download without the destination directory existing, we expect you to create that directory. We can't represent that in Go's type system. So that's an implementation detail that's easy to miss when you're implementing a thing, implementing a downloader. And so we actually export a function called test downloader that runs through a bunch of table tests for any generic downloader to ensure that the behavior is what we expect. Um, we also export things like mock structures so that if you wanted to pass a downloader mock and test that it's downloading the right thing, you have that. Uh, the last thing is uh, we, I have this, this package called Go Testing Interface, and what it does is it creates a testing.t. It actually is called that interface. Um, and we, you, we use that for the test helpers, because if you actually import the real testing package, that adds flags to the global flag thing. And so if, if, if the, the package importing your own package uses the global flags, then they'll all of a sudden all have these run and so on flags introduced, and that's annoying. So if you use the interface, uh, then you could pass it on in. So here's an example of that test config. We import this. We use the interface. You can see it's missing the asterisk. Um, you could still use it like it's a testing.t, and you could pass a real testing.t into it. OK. We're getting there. Um, custom frameworks. So uh, GoTest is a really incredible workflow tool. So when we do things that aren't quite unit tests, we still try to fit it into, I don't know, are they kicking? I still have time. <laughs> Um, I'll keep talking, though. So we still try to fit these tests that don't, uh, oh, maybe it's, maybe it's my fault, actually. My computer may have died. I don't know. Um, I'll just talk through that one, and then I'll probably have to end after that one, because I don't have the slides anymore. Um, but when we build things that don't quite fit unit tests, we still try to build um, build them into the Go test workflow. So a good example with this is Terraform has an acceptance test library. What the acceptance test library does is it takes real Terraform configurations, and then from the real Terraform configurations, it creates real infrastructure, and it's black boxy in a way. It's mostly black box. Um, and we, we run these every night. Um, we spin up thousands of resources on something like 50 different providers every night. Um, and we use Go tests to trigger this, even though they're not unit tests. And so what we did was we built our own framework that we call from a test um, that has its own API. It doesn't look like a unit test at all. It doesn't call fatal F or any of those things. Um, it just basically is a structure that says, here are the config files to run. Here are the credentials for the cloud platform. Here are some you know, tests to run, like you should be able to reach this IP. Um, this, if you run this API call, then it should return an instance. We, we do that. And then we run it with a special flag by introducing flags like I showed you earlier, like the update flag. We actually have like an acceptance flag. And so when you run go test with the acceptance flag, then it runs the acceptance test suite, skips all the rest, uh, and we get features like that in 
In Vault, it's the same way. We, in Vault, we have an acceptance test framework for um, testing secret backends, off backends, and all these different things. Same thing. We built a custom framework to make writing those easy, um, but you still execute them with Go tests. It just as a workflow is what we try to do. Um, I think there's only two more sections. I'm going to put the slides online, so um, I'll end there, and I'm out of time anyway. So thank you. <laughs>